Hey guys, this is a video about how I connected my in-floor shop heat to my outdoor wood stove. I'm making the video because there was so little information out there. I finally found a YouTuber um, that was more than accommodating, help, very helpful, and I based all my design on his. I'll link him below and I encourage you to go to his website, his channel to see exactly what he did. And uh, so all credit really is to him for being helpful and going the extra mile to help another do-it-yourselfer. So first of all, standard wood stove. I have my heat master. Uh, they're made in Canada, highly recommended. Um, I, it's been doing great. I have the C250 series, titanium. Um, it's working great. The back of it is just your standard, like everybody else has. I have two zones. One on the right goes to my house, heats my entire home, about 3,000 square feet. And the one on the left is going to my garage and my shop and i'll explain that in just a moment uh, let's go into the shop and i'll show you what i have basically both lines just run on the ground one to the house uh, the one on the left is going directly to the garage adjacent i'll show you what's inside so here's my heat panel itself for the shop now my shop is 30 by 35 you can see i have uh, four loops going into the floor each loop is about 250 feet, and it's important that you keep them somewhat uh, equal in distance. It has to do with water flow and equal, equal pressure and flow. Uh, there is a maximum that you're supposed to do. I don't remember off the top of my head. I want to say 300, but I know I read other people going farther and claiming no issues. So this heat panel is actually connected to my garage heater. In the garage, I have a hanging from the ceiling heater like you've all seen, but I only have two circuits in my wood stove, but I needed three. So what I did is disconnect one of the uh, supply hoses from that hanging heater. I ran these white hoses from the hanging heater in the garage adjacent, and then the return just goes back to that uh, the supply side of the hanging garage. If you have questions of that, ask me. I'll send you a picture or something. Um, the white pecs you see there is about 55 feet each line. So I have a typical pump on the back of the wood stove, 1 25th of a horse that's running uh, probably 120 feet or so, plus about a 18 foot lift and it has no issues it's a three-speed motor like the one on this panel and it seems to have no issues so let's just start on one end i'll show you what i got on the left we have the manifold most of these things i got are just off amazon uh, low cost four zones work perfect i did put a pressure switch with just a garden hose fitting on the end um, gives me my pressure that's not running the hose at the bottom is how I filled the system with a just a water transfer pump uh, just one of your typical ones right there and I do have it filled with water mixed with antifreeze so following on the blue side this is the cold water return side it gets to over here to your mixing valve and the mixing valve is important you can't have super hot water going into cement you can damage your floors you can do that in your house the water coming from the wood stove is about 180 degrees that mixing valve i have throttled down to where it's mixing it around 100 degrees maybe 110 and then when the return water comes back cold enough it opens up this valve which then allows it to go down and mix with the heat exchanger that's a 50 plate heat exchanger off amazon again a vivar give you a little closer there seems to be working great you can see where i put a couple unions in uh, most of my system is all copper with uh, i sweated the, the joints no leaks everything's great i'm in the process of insulating it as we talk so once it goes and mixes with the hot water side those two never mix this is from the wood stove from there to there and then on the floor heat side a second loop it's from here to there so these two waters never mix but it exchanges heat 
then it comes back up, goes back to the valve, and then continues on its way. If the water coming out is hot enough, this valve will just bypass, open up, and just let it go right down and then circulate again. It seems to be very efficient. Once the cement is warmed up, it, uh, it stays warm. It took 24 hours to warm up my cement and my shop. So once it can travel on its travels, it goes up, over, it goes to this thermal expansion tank. Interesting thing about this is I bought it and I did not realize it was preset to 44 pounds of pressure. That's way too much for uh, this type of system for radiant floor heat. You want about 10 to 15. Uh, they come pre-charged at 12 normally. So I, of course, let a bunch of air out to lower the pressure. This is, uh, what's the fancy word for it, but it releases air. Um, as it gets in here, it swirls around, air comes out, and you can hear a lot of air escaping when you first start your system, and then you have to refill with more fluid, obviously. Continues its journey towards the pump. Here we have a controller. I only need a one zone controller. This is a four because um, I got it brand new at an auction for five bucks and uh, why not use it? Um, so it's overkill, but I only have one zone hooked up. Same with that expansion tank. They're about $60 and I bought it for $3 brand new at an auction. Um, so yeah, I used it. Pump, uh, it's your typical gun force. 125th of a horse. It has three speeds at the top. I have it set on medium. No real reason why. I'm just trying it. Um, right below is that mixing valve I just showed you. Let me show you. I have it. It goes from minimum to max. It's 85 to 150 degrees and I have it just under two. And that's giving me that 110 degrees temperature. Continuing on the journey. Um, Thermostat, this is a Wi-Fi controlled thermostat. It's overkill. This is one of those fancy ones, but I like to be able to connect it and check it remotely. Um, I have it on 68 degrees. It's 68 to 70 in here right now. Thermostat calls for more heat. Goes over to your controller, which then tells the pump, come on. And then it pumps the hot water from the heat exchanger into the supply side. The thermometer uh, will change when it's running. That's just re residential, residual heat is what I'm looking for, 70 degrees, but it'll go up to 110 when it's running. And I can show you that in a moment. Bye. Let's crank it up. One thing that did throw me off on this manifold from Amazon, Chinese, of course, the directions were backwards. These are valves underneath. You lift these up and turn them, they literally showed uh, going the direction of closed, which was open. It was opposite. So that threw me. I had no circulation, couldn't figure out why, until I turned them the complete opposite way, and that opened these. Um, this works with a plunger type. As it gets pushed down, the water flows down. So that's the supply side, and then this would be the return for that same zone. These can also be shut off if you want to adjust. Uh, these are flow adjusters, so if you have one that's way higher or lower than the other, you can turn the valve to adjust it. The end here also acts as an air escape, lets it out, fancy word for it, no fluid comes out. And that is really the system. I'm going to hold still if you need to take a photo because that's how I did mine. I looked at the other YouTubers, um, took a photograph of it. And I just went and copied it, basically. Um, I did not put as many unions or valves as he did. I just assumed or figured if I needed to, I would cut the copper and then use a, a shark bite fitting or something similar. Um, but I would address it once I had a leak. This panel, what you're seeing here, I priced out. Copper's not cheap. Um, there's about 20 feet of copper in there. $55 for every 10 foot. Um, so what you're seeing here, I priced out about $1,300 in my labor. Maybe a little less because a couple of the items came from an auction. Uh, I did ask companies about doing this. Uh, one company quoted me $2,500. They're the same company that supplies Menards. However, they do not supply one that goes to a wood stove. 
The difference is this big heat exchanger. Um, all the others they had were for instant hot water heaters, etc., and doesn't have that piece. For $2,500, I asked the company, because Menards doesn't sell it, I contacted the company direct. I asked for a quote, they gave it to me. I asked them what exactly was I getting, because it, you know, that's a lot of money. Um, so I kind of asked them what exactly will I get on the panel. Their reply was, sorry, we couldn't help you. Good luck with your project. They did not want to talk to me about what's on here. Nobody does. I contacted a local company. Two weeks to get a quote. They want $3,000. I asked them, I understand the parts are about $1,300 my cost. What exactly is the extra almost $2,000 of labor on your end? And again, they would not answer me or tell me what parts they were using on the panel. It seems to be a big secret, probably because they're charging so much. So if you have questions, get a hold of me. This has been running for about five days now. It works awesome. It's perfect. It is working so well, I'm in, very impressed. There are cheaper ways to go. I could have went with another hanging garage heater like the garage has, uh, but the heat is way different, guys. The heat's coming from the floor up. It is so warm and comfortable in here. The heater in my garage heats the whole garage. However, it's not the same. There's hot and cold spots, there's drafts. It's hot at the ceiling, cold at the floor. This is opposite, this is this is well worth it if you can swing it and willing to do the work, it's well worth it. So I did turn that on uh, just so you can see, it, you know, it is flowing, that is hot. Pump is very quiet. Um, you can see right now my supply side is about 100 degrees. I can't show you the return side temperature. Well, let's see if we can do it quickly because I'll explain why in a moment. That is at 70 degrees. What happened is I had a bit of a leak and I had to turn this valve to tighten it and um, it put it on the opposite side. I just need to flip it over to this side and I will do that. So as far as leaks, wherever I soldered, no leaks at all. I use that uh, Teflon paste for my fittings. What do they call it? Blue Gorilla or Monkey or something like that. It was horrible. Everywhere I use that paste, I had horrible leaks. Um, so I had to take it apart, clean all that off. The answer seemed to be when I used Teflon tape and then paste over it, tightened everything down and my leaks have now stopped. So sorry, the video is a little longer than I anticipated. Um, it's out there cause I only found one guy willing to show and to share the information. I'm going to link to him. He has the actual parts list, uh, in his comments. And I want to give him all credit for this. Um, and he's got a pretty cool channel. If, if you're looking at this, he's got stuff on his channel that you're probably interested in. So go over there and take a look at it. And uh, it's pretty cool. All right. If you have any questions, leave a comment. I'll answer the best I can. And uh, thanks for looking.